It is good to be here. Uh, This morning, uh, I want to turn our attention to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. Before I jump into Nehemiah, I just want to say just a few things about CPO. um, And then I want to spend the rest of the time in the Word. Uh, For those of you who don't know, Chicagoland Prison Outreach, it was started um, 28 years ago. Uh, We exist to do three things. Uh, We provide chaplains and volunteers to jails, prisons, and detention centers. And those volunteers and chaplains, they teach the Word of God. They make disciples inside of those institutions. Um, We we also serve individuals who have returned from jail and or prison. Sometimes you call those individuals returning citizens, uh, returning residents, ex-offenders. We we serve them, one, in discipling them. But we also have a vocational trade school. We have a school on the south side of town, and we're opening up a school right here, right down the street here in Evanston, currently finishing up some remodeling, and hopefully we'll roll out some classes there um, this month, this year yet. Um, Then we also provide care to families who have a loved one that's incarcerated. And we like to get churches involved, what I say in like a non-threatening way to get engaged in uh, prison ministry. And so the, we, we are so excited about what God has been doing in the ministry, the many, many lives that are being impacted and those who've been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so again, thank you for your partnership and together we're making an impact in the Chicagoland area. As, as, as I was thinking um, over the last few weeks what to share with you, um, Nehemiah can, kept coming to mind. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a, a place in which God has had me settled all year, um, and I sensed that the Lord wanted me uh, to share with you Nehemiah chapter 1 uh, today. Uh, I'm sure I won't be quite an hour, um, <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll have fun along this ride. Can we look to the Lord in prayer? Father, we have gathered here on the Lord's Day to worship your holy name, to to acknowledge, God, that, that you are holy, holy, holy. You are other than anything. There is no one like you, and there is no one beside you. God, you are our everything, and without you, we can do nothing. Without you, we can't pray, we can't witness, we can't walk, we can't lead. Lord, we need you in every way. And God, even as we turn to your holy word, this sacred word that is just not a fancy book with ink in its pages, but it's your word that is breathed out to us. It is the very breath of you, God. I pray, God, that you would open up our hearts, that you would allow us to have ears to hear what it is the Spirit is saying to the church. I do pray, Father, that you would set me aside, that you would hide me behind the cross, that you would calm my spirit and help me to speak with simplicity, clarity, and with power. I pray, God, that you would send your anointing that makes preaching easy. Forgive us, God, of all of our sins, all of our trespasses. Lord, we don't want anything to hinder us from being close and near to you. God, we ask that you have your way in these few moments that we have. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Today, I want to talk about stepping up. Somebody say step up. There was a pastor who was enjoying his late Monday morning. As he was enjoying his late Monday morning, he couldn't help but to reflect on his glorious time in worship. He he had just preached a message called Stepping Up. And he had decided to take a walk as he continued to remember how God moved mightily in service on Sunday. As he was walking through the neighborhood, he found a young boy. The young boy was, was, was attempting to ring a bell, but it seemed like the bell was just too 
high for him to reach. So the pastor thought, this is my time. This is my opportunity for me to apply the very message that I preach. Now I can step up. Pastor did just that. Stepped up on the porch. Stood alongside the boy. And he began to ring the bell aggressively. Looked at the boy and said, what now? The little boy said, run like crazy. (laughs) Well, this is not what we mean when we say step up. When we look at the book of Nehemiah, we we, we see a a man and a group of people who step up. These individuals, they, they, they do not shy away from the challenge. What, 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 what amazes me is, is, that, is that some people will, will jump in to be a part of the solution instead of criticizing the problem. What, what amazes me even about Nehemiah is that we see his bravery, we see his courage, we see his sacrifice, and we see his selflessness. And as we look at the book of Nehemiah, it teaches us what it means to step up. And I would encourage you, as we'll look at chapter 1 today, I would encourage you to to read the entire book of Nehemiah. But but as we would talk about stepping up, there is an important note for us to know. That you can't step up unless you've been set up. Ooh, we ought to say that again. You, you, You can't step up unless you've been set up. Now, I know that language set up, that's like bad language to use in the city of Chicago because none of us wants to be set up. But I want you to know that God sets us up. And we see that clearly in the book of Nehemiah. Look look, look with me at chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hecloniah, now what happened in the month of Keslev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judea. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who has survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The walls of Jerusalem is broken and his gates are destroyed by fire. Here we see in these few verses that Nehemiah has been set up. Nehemiah is in Susa. Susa is a major city that's about 150 miles from Persia, the Persian Gulf. Susa was, was, was a vacation place for the kings. And Keslev was around November or December. So when we think about Susa, we can kind of think about Susa as Susa would be like our Florida. Susa would be like our Jamaica. Susa would be like our, our, our Cancun. Susa would, would, would be that, that place of, of luxury. And when we look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah is in this place of luxury. But, but the reality is, is that this hasn't always been the case for Nehemiah. Nehemiah was once in exile. In Ezra 2, we we read that he was a part of one of the first groups that was released from exile. And when we read this, we realize that Nehemiah, he he is in Susa. He's he's in this place where the king's vacation. The the last sentence in chapter 1 tells us that he was a cupbearer. And and, and being a a cupbearer, it meant that he had a trusted role in the king's court. We understand that cupbearers, they they bring wine to the king and they understand the king's etiquette. But cupbearers, they they were trusted by the king. They were actually like the king's advisor. It may not seem like a cupbearer was a prominent position. It doesn't seem like if you went to a prominent school like Harvard or Princeton or Oxford that you would pursue to be a cupbearer. But a cupbearer was a major position in the king's court. And so Nehemiah, whose life has not always been easy, he is now living in the life of luxury. And if we understand that he once was an exile, we understand that he was once living in captivity, but now he's living in comfort. 
That that he was once living in loss, but now he's living in luxury. He was once a nobody, and now he is a somebody as a cupbearer in Susa, working with the king and in the king's court. God has done great things for Nehemiah. God has set him up. And, 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 And just in case, just to give you news, I'm sure you already know this, but many of us in the room, we've been set up too. That that, that God has done some marvelous things in our lives. That God has opened doors for us. God has made ways for us. God has turned our lives around. He's picked us up. He's transitioned us. He's transformed us. God has done some great things for us. And the reason a lot of times why God blesses us is that God is actually setting us up so that we can step up. I'm here today pretty much because there was a white brother who's a businessman. And in his, in his late 30s, he had gotten a phone call from his father-in-law. His father-in-law said, hey, I just heard on Moody Radio that they're looking for volunteers to come to the jail. And this businessman, he loved God, loved the word of God. He said, I'll go. And, and Dan Sweats, white gentleman in the picture, is our founder of Chicagoland Prison Outreach. That day, him and his father-in-law, they went to Cook County Jail. And he has been going to jails and prisons ever since for the last 35 years years. But it started with this message from his father-in-law. It, it, was, it was actually like all a part of a setup. And interestingly, in verse 2, Nehemiah gets a message. We read it here that, that his brother Hananiah shows up. Hananiah shows up with, with, with others from Judea, and they come to give Nehemiah a report. Nehemiah is, is concerned about, about those who, who were in Jerusalem, who have been free from exile. He wants to know, how are they living? What's going on in their life? And, and, and here the report is, is that there is great trouble, that they are in great shame, that, that the walls are broken down and the gates are destroyed. And this message, it interrupts Nehemiah's life. This message that his brother shares with him, it interrupts his life. Yeah, it was probably meant to interrupt his life because it was all part of the setup. But to really understand the the, the predicament that they were in in Jerusalem, we we must look at the larger context. And and they were in the predicament they were in with the gates destroyed and the, the walls broken down and being in shame and being in trouble because of something that happened in the past. And in the past, when we look at the history of the children of Israel, we know that they have found themselves worshiping idols and false gods. And and God raised up the Babylonian people. And the Babylonians came in and overtook um, Jerusalem, took captive the children of Israel, destroyed Jerusalem, and destroyed the temple that Solomon built. And for 70 years, the children of Israel were in captivity. And God arranged by his miraculous ways to deliver many of them out of, out of exile and so that they could go back to restore worship. And in 516 B.C., somewhere around then, they rebuilt the temple. The problem here is, is that it has now been 70 plus years since they have rebuilt the temple. The temple is built but the city is still in ruins, that the walls are still broken down, there is still trouble and great shame. And and the reason why this is a problem because broken walls means that there are broken people. A ruined city means that there are ruined people. And, And here Nehemiah, when he hears this, he's not just hearing about a city that's in trouble. He's not just hearing about a city that has shame. He's hearing about a people that are broken, a people that are filled with trouble, a people that are filled with shame. And and his heart is breaking. 
because he realizes that the people are broken, that they have gotten comfortable in the ruins around them, that they've gotten comfortable with the brokenness around them. And his heart is breaking. This message that he hears, it interrupts his life. There are many things we can do when we hear a message or we hear the truth. We can decide to dismiss it. We can decide to ignore it. We, we can choose to say, I, I don't want to allow this thing to make me feel guilty in any way. Or, or we can choose to believe it. And, and, and Nehemiah, he, he hears this message and he believes the truth. It is not just their truth, but it is his truth. Even though they are in Jerusalem, he is living in comfort in Susa. It is his truth. It is not just their reality. It is his reality. And he has real empathy and real sorrow. And his heart is breaking for his people. Look what he does. Verse 3. With verse 4. It says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days as I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Ne Nehemiah did not just have these emotional feelings about people who were far away. But, but his, his, his feelings and his emotions led to an action, his, his, his internalizing this message and this message that has interrupted his life, it, it leads him into this action, this action in which, in which one, he sits down to mourn. He, he, he cries as if, someone, as, if he, as if he's lost a loved one. He fasts to deny himself food, and he prays to seek God. I think it's amazing to me that Nehemiah is having this emotional, real moment about people, real people, who are dealing with brokenness and ruin. And yet there is a temple in Jerusalem. That there is a place of worship. There are people attending worship. But it's important for us to know that just because people don the doors of a church doesn't mean that they have peace in their minds or in their hearts. Just because people come to worship doesn't mean that they're filled with joy. I know we look good. I know we smell good. But some of us really aren't good. I know some of us are really broken. Some of us are really ruined on the inside. Some of us are really a mess. And some of us are like, it is so good that you really can't see what's going on on the inside of me. And Nehemiah realized that the people are broken that way. And he prays. He hears this message that interrupts his life. He internalizes it, but then, then he intercedes. In, in verses 5 through 11, he prays. And notice his prayer in verse 5. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. You notice how he prays? He, he, prays the way, he prays the way we should pray, that we should begin our prayers with a sense of adoration, a sense of, of acknowledgement, knowing who we are praying to. He realizes that he has this privilege and, and, and the pleasure of going before the throne of God. Who is, who is not only the king, but he is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He is the ancient of days. He is the magnificent, intelligent designer. When we look at his creations, we see the display of his wisdom. We see his creativity and his brilliance all around us. And we have the privilege of going before him in prayer. And Nehemiah, he acknowledges that this God he is praying to, that he resides in heaven, but he is Lord over all. 
And that this God, he is not only transcendent, bigger and greater than all of us, but he is imminent. He is right with us. And he is the kind of God that will intervene in our situation and in our lives. God loves it when we come before his throne. He, he loves to see his children running to him. With, 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 with the small things or the big things. God isn't offended if a kid asks him, Lord, I can't find my He-Man. They don't play with He-Mans no more, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, God loves it when we approach it strong. And Nehemiah is a prayer warrior. When we read throughout the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is infatuated with the presence of God. He's infatuated with praying and coming before God because he realizes that he can't do it himself. But he, need God. he needs God's help. And he prays. He acknowledges this God, but he also acknowledges that, that he is Yahweh, that he is this, this covenant God. This, and when we talk about covenant, we realize that God enters into a personal, eternal relationship with his people. That God enters into this eternal, personal relationship with his people. And, and his people experience God's love. And, 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 and I love how the Bible talks about God's love. And, 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 and really the, the covenant language of God's love is, is, is his steadfast love and faithfulness. See, love by itself is good. But when you understand that God's love is steadfast, it is strong. It is endurable. It can stand the test of times. It can deal with the ups and with the downs. That God's love is with us when we're in the valley. God's love is with us when we're on the mountaintops. That God can deal with our mess. God can deal with our triflingness. God can deal with our ratchetness. God is with us. His love is steadfast. Newsflash. That there's nothing you can do to make God love you anymore. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. God's love is steadfast. That's why he's so amazing. Because he has this steadfast love, this faithfulness for those who are in covenant with him. Those who have this personal relationship. And when we pray, we realize that we are praying to this God who has entered into a personal, eternal relationship with us. He is the same God who put the stars in the sky. And Nehemiah is praying to that God. And when we pray, we not only acknowledge who God is, but we also have to acknowledge who we are. Nehemiah does something pretty amazing here. Verse 6, I got it as 6B, but I'll read A too. Let your ears be attentive and your eyes open to hear, to hear the prayers of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you. And have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. He confesses his sins. But not, not only does he confess his sins, he confesses the sins of his family, the sins of his, of his ancestors. This is a big deal. Because the reality is... We like to think we're good people trying to do the right thing. Not only do we like to think that we are good people trying to do the right thing, we like to think our family is good people and our ancestors are good people trying to do the right thing. But I have good news. I have bad news for you. That is bad theology. There's no one good. You're not good. Your family is not good. Your ancestors are not good. And you know what? I'm just a postman. I didn't make it up. It's in Romans 3. There is none good, no, not one. 
We all were born into sin, shaped into iniquity. We are all guilty. It's easy to point the finger at those who are incarcerated because we know that they committed a crime. But newsflash, every human being has broken God's law and is a criminal in God's eyes. And the only way we can, only way we can be found not guilty is through the blood of Jesus. It's, it's, it's only through the saving, atoning work of Jesus Christ that we find forgiveness of our sins and we are justified just as if we never sinned, that we receive forgiveness of our sins, but it's only through Jesus. Friends, only God is good. And if you're here or if you're watching and you know your sins are great. You know that your sins are many. And you have been convicted and bothered by your sins. I want you to know that there is forgiveness for you. That God wants to forgive you. He longs to forgive you. Jesus died so that you can be forgiven. God bankrupted heaven so that you can be forgiven of your sins. You just got to ask him. You just got to confess your sins. We have to humble ourselves. Family, it is, it, is, it is no issue with saying, I was guilty. I sinned. As Adam said, I ate. I did it. Then I find forgiveness from God. He prays. He asks God to forgive him of his sins. Forgive his family. But, but, but he, as he prays for his family and for his people, he is praying as a leader that is longing to lead people in the forgiveness of sins. I can pray and I can ask God to forgive my people, but, but they have to ask God themselves. That's why we need them to come to the Alpha course. Because they, they, they have to ask God themselves. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lastly, in this prayer, see something here. Is that he continues to bring, bring things back to God's remembrance. We see it in, in verse 5 when, when he says, you are the God who keeps covenant. In verse 8, he tells him to remember your commands. He, he's bringing these things back to God's remembrance. It's, it, it's not as if God has forgotten anything, but, but when, we, when we bring God's word back up to him, we, we, we are demonstrating that we trust him. We, 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 we are showing God, we're saying, God, you said it and we believe it and we are holding to your word. And, and, and he calls these things back to God's remembrance. And this is a helpful practice to all of us. When we see Moses praying, there were many times in which, in which Moses thought God was going to unleash his wrath on all the children of Israel. And Moses reminded God of his promises. But I think there's something else happening here. It's not just the fact that, 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 that he's bringing God's promises back up to him. It is this, this remembrance thing. Because this is the work of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the Holy Spirit causes us to remember the word of God. He causes us to remember the, the promises of God. And whenever God is doing something, that, 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 there is this, that, 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 these holy ingredients, the word of God and the spirit of God. If you don't believe me, look at Genesis 1. As the Spirit of God was hovering and God spoke and things were. Here, the, 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 the Spirit of God is, is, is working on Nehemiah. There is this internal work that, that is happening in Nehemiah. It's the Holy Spirit is doing something. In order for Nehemiah to step up, he, he first must be set up. This message that has interrupted his life, this message that he has internalized. And now it appears that there is a working going on in him. 
as a pastor who was attempting to finish his sermon on a Saturday morning. He had to watch his son that morning and had expected that his son would be able to go outside to play while he finished his sermon. However, there was a severe thunderstorm. And so now the pastor is thinking, how am I going to finish my sermon because my son won't let me get it done? So the pastor came up with a brilliant idea. He grabbed the magazine. He flipped through it. He seen a picture of the world, and he tore it out. He ripped it into pieces and spread it over his family room floor. He told his son, he said, son, this is what I want you to do while daddy's working on the sermon. I want you to put this puzzle of the world together. And when you're done, come knock on my door and I'll give you a dollar. The father just knew this is going to keep him busy for several hours. Son came knocking on the door 20 minutes later. Dad, I'm done. What? How did you finish so fast? The son said, I realized that that was a picture of the man on the other side. So I flipped the piece of paper under and I put the man together. Then I put another piece of paper over and I flipped it over and that was the world. He said, I knew if I get the man right, then I'll get the world right. The father said, son, you not only earned a dollar, but you just helped me preach. He said, he said and it, you, 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 you get it that if, if we get the man right, then the world around us will get right. When we look at what's happening in Nehemiah chapter 1, God is getting Nehemiah right so that Nehemiah can get his world around him right. And God does the same thing with us, is that God wants to work on us to get us right so that we can get the world around us right. I got three, I got three points of implication or application to give you, and then I'm going to take my seat and we can get ready to eat some wieners. The first one is this, is that your, your past and your pain is often connected to your purpose. Your past and your pain is often connected to your purpose. It was in the early 2000s, I read this book with a group of men, and as we was reading it, we got to this one section. I'll read it for you. It says, most amazing, God decided how you would be born. Regardless of the circumstances of your birth or who your parents are, God had a plan in creating you. It doesn't matter whether your parents were good or bad or indifferent. God knew that those two individuals possessed exactly the right genetic makeup to create the custom you he had in mind. They had the DNA God wanted to make you. And there was other parts to this that God knew where you'd be born and he knew where you would live. That bothered me. It bothered me in a bad way. And it bothered me for just a little while. Because I was thinking, I was like, I, and, and when I ran it through my theological filters at that time, I was like, Rick Warren is right. But I didn't like it. Because I was like, God, Oprah Winfrey could have been my mother and Michael Jordan could have been my daddy. <laughs> Instead, I grew up in rat and roach infested homes, dealing with poverty and so much pain and misery and seeing things that probably young kids shouldn't see at early ages, experience things that kids should not even experience. Holy Spirit sat me down and he said, it is true, Corey, but unless you had that past and unless you experienced that pain, you wouldn't be the man you are today. You wouldn't do the things that you do today. You would reach the people that you reach today. You may be going through some kind of pain, but God uses our pain. God never wastes a good hurt. Let me say that again. God never wastes a good hurt. God uses our pain. He uses our misery. He uses all those things for his purpose. And even though your past may be raggedy, God has a purpose in all of that. And God uses our past and our pain for his purpose. 
Second thing I want to share with you is that we got to make sure we internalize the message. Ne- Nehemiah got a message from his brother. Clearly, when we read it, we see that it wasn't a message from the Word of God. But, but, but this message was so profound, it, he knew that, that this message came from God, that, that God was doing something. And, 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 and it makes me point to the fact that we hear so many messages. We hear so many sermons. We, we include in so many Bible studies and so many small groups. What are we doing with the word that we receive? Are are we internalizing the word? Are we allowing the word of God to percolate in our hearts and to change us? If you go to a good first store, you'll notice that they have good security. You go to a good jewelry store, you'll notice they got good security. You go to a good bank, you'll notice They got good security. You know why? Because they realize that there is something valuable in there. And when we understand that the word of God is precious, it is valuable, it is more precious than silver, gold, rubies, or anything, cryptocurrency, whatever your rather is. And we we must protect the word of God. Jesus teaches us that the thief wants to come and steal the word of God right after it is sown. And we must protect the word of God and allow the message to be internalized in our lives and in our hearts. I got to make sure that the word of God is working in us and we internalize his message. Lastly, verse 11 here. I want to sum up Nehemiah's prayer request. He is praying for favor. He's praying that God will give him success, mercy with man. And he's looking for favor. Can I tell you that Nehemiah already had favor? He just needed to be focused. Oh, I need to say that again. Nehemiah already had favor. He just needed to be focused. That God had already done everything he needed on the outside. God had already set him up. Here he was a man who was once in captivity. Now he's working for the king. He has been in position. He has received favor. He has wisdom and brilliance and intelligence. All that he needs, God has already set him up. He doesn't need favor on the outside. He needs focus on the inside. That God is looking to do something in him. When I was 19, I had a Jacob-like moment where I wrestled with God. I wish I had a better way to explain this moment and this time, but it was like wrestling with God. And really, really, really this this wrestling, it was this intense moment. But when I look over maybe 14, 15 years of my life, I, I had in a sense been running from God. I had been, in a sense, denying God. Even as a young kid, I always knew that that God had a purpose for my life, that that God wanted to use me for his purposes. But I always said no. But I was 19 years old. I was incarcerated. And at that point, I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison. At that point, I, I had already committed my life to the Lord. But I still was saying no to God. God, God was calling me. He was giving me assignments. And I was saying no to him. And it was this one day in the midnight hour, it was like this this wrestling I had with God. And it was, I, I think I was asleep and it was like the Lord woke me up. It was the midnight hour. Everybody else was asleep. I was agitated. I was frustrated. I was annoyed. And, and it was like God was talking to me. And, and if anybody was like watching this, they would have thought I was having a mental breakdown. And I remember standing at the door of my cell saying yes to God. And God wanted me to say yes to two things. One, that I would go to Bible college. 
I didn't even know if I was going to get out of prison. But I was saying, yes, Lord, I'll go to Bible college. You just stop wrestling with me. Yes, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll be a chaplain. I'll, I'll, I'll go back into jails and prisons and do your work. I was 19 years old. I didn't have any categories of all of this. Didn't even know if I was going to get out of prison. I've been going into jails and prisons as a chaplain for 18 plus years. Graduated from Bible college and serving as a pastor for 12 years. The best thing I could do that day was to say yes to the Lord. Was to hear his message and to respond. And that's what God does in us. Nehemiah is probably having a positive experience. But many of us, we have this internal wrestling with God. And God is trying to get us to say yes to him. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Maybe somebody here under the sound of my voice, you need to say yes to God. Maybe watching online, you may need to say yes to God. And, and, and maybe your yes to God, it is, it is just that, yes, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. That, Lord, I I can't do this. I can't lead my life. I can't guide my life. I keep making destructive decisions. Lord, I don't want to burn in the lake of fire. I want to be in a relationship with you. And I just want to say yes to you, Lord. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want you to forgive me of my sins. And maybe somebody here, you, 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 you've been fighting with God. You've been running from God. You, you have been refusing to say yes to God. He keeps telling you he has an assignment and a call on your life. But you keep denying it. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that God sent me here because there's somebody here. That God has been poking you. and He's been trying to get your attention and get you to say yes to him. If you say yes, he'll do the rest. But you got to be brave enough to say yes to him. I want to pray with you. You can bow your heads and close your eyes. You can't win a fight with God. You can't out-wrestle God. Jacob lost, and he held on to God afterwards. Not to wrestle because he realized that God was his only help. Let me pray for you. Father, Lord, today I pray for my brother. I pray for my sister. Lord, you know them all too well. And I pray, God, that you would give them the courage and the boldness to say yes to you. I pray, Lord, that you would give them the vision to see past their circumstances and past their situations. Lord, we know that your word says that we should look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Help us, Lord, to to see like joy like Jesus did beyond the cross. And I pray that you would give that to my brother and my sister. Lord, help us to say yes to your will. Yes to your way. Help us to say yes, Lord. Wherever you're calling me, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, yes, Lord. Lord, here's my hands. Yes, Lord. Here's my mind. Yes, Lord. Here's my feet, Lord. Here's my heart. Here's my whole being. Here's my whole life, Lord. I I, I give it all to you, Lord. Lord, help us to be willing to sacrifice our comfort to serve you. Help us to be selfless and to recklessly and radically follow you because Lord we know you recklessly love us and you have recklessly gone after us 
Be our help, Lord. Help us to say yes to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you like and subscribe, this video reaches more people.